Hey everybody, welcome to Alan Wall's Photography. This is Alan and today we are reviewing another remarkable lens from Leowa. This is the 100mm T2.9 Macro Cine Lens. You're going to love this lens. So today I am going to tell you about the Leowa 100mm T2.9 apochromatic two times magnification macro cine lens it's a mouthful and uh, it's a handful it's a big heavy solid lump of metal and glass that does a fantastic job of uh, shooting video so if your immediate reaction to hearing about this lens is hang on a second what is a macro cine lens i've never heard of such a thing well i hadn't either to be honest and uh, I'd never really given it much thought. I know that shooting uh, video using a macro lens is very difficult. I've done plenty of it uh, over the years. And uh, the thought that maybe there would be an easier way to do it was very appealing to me. Uh, and I read about this lens and uh, learned quite a bit about it. And this is a, a, a very fine example of the kind of thing that Leowa does when it anticipates a need, uh, a, a problem that photographers are having and makes something to fix that problem. And that's what they've done with this lens. But right from the start, I want to be clear about one thing. Owning a nice macro cine lens that can do everything you need it to do does not make macro cine any easier to shoot. I am witness to that. It is very difficult to shoot good macro video. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of lens you have. It doesn't matter how expensive it is. If you have a bad lens or a poorly suited lens, it makes it a lot harder. Uh, but uh, it doesn't make it easier. It just makes the footage better. And uh, you still have to learn how to do it, is my point. And it's tough, as you will see, to my shame. Anyway, let's talk about this lens for a minute. What is a macro cine lens? Well, to understand that, you have to kind of understand what a macro lens is and what a cine lens is, because this is, as it sounds, a combination of the two. Now, normally, when a company combines two sets of features to make a third thing, it's terrible. Uh, I bought one of the first and only, I think they only made about six of them, Volkswagen automatic manual transmission Beetles. It was my first car. It was blue. Then it changed color, oddly, uh, as I washed it. The p blue color came off. But anyway, neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is uh, that thing had a gear sh shift and no clutch pedal. It was an automatic manual transmission. And it was just terrible. They needed to decide one way or the other, whether it was automatic or manual. And my first impression of this lens was, well, why would you do that? So my initial impression of a lens that was designed to do two very special things together, I was a bit hesitant about it. I needed to wait and see. But let me tell you, it succeeds. It, it does exactly the two things it's supposed to do, and it does them in one lens, which is amazing. So what is a macro lens and what is a cine lens? Well, first the macro lens, the one you're more familiar with. A macro lens flips a regular camera lens around on its tail. It uh, switches around some elements and adds a number of uh, uh, very complicated moving parts inside the lens so that instead of taking a large subject and making a small representation of it on your sensor, which is what a camera lens is designed to do, the macro lens takes a small subject and makes a large representation of it on your camera uh, sensor. And that's exactly what a macro lens is supposed to do. And uh, the higher the magnification, the macro lens, the more effectively it does that. Uh, so most macro lenses are one to one, meaning the size of the subject is represented in a life sized image on the sensor. Now, a lens like this, which is a two to one macro lens, will show the subject twice the size that it actually is on the, on the sensor. So that is a very specialized kind of lens and it requires a, a number of different elements to be introduced into the lens. 
it usually has a, a, a group of elements in the middle of the lens that floats and moves backwards and forwards independently of the rest of the lens. There are lots of ways that we use camera lenses to take macro photographs. We turn them around, we add extension, um, and these are just a couple of the ways that we can uh, make a larger image uh, of a smaller subject, and it allows us to focus closer uh, so that the image on our sensor is larger. Now, that is all good and well, and you could even try to, to shoot some video that way, but the fact of the matter is it's extremely difficult because a lens created in that way is only going to have a very, very narrow range in which you can focus at all. Uh, and once you're out of focus, there's no image. It won't focus beyond uh, a, a short distance. In other words, you cannot focus at infinity. That just won't work in a situation like this, where you're shooting cine, where you want to be able to shoot things far away and have them in focus and bring the focusing closer uh, on your subject. Uh, it's obviously, that would be an important part of, of how you use such a lens. A cine lens, on the other hand, uh, is a little bit more like a camera lens, but it has some features built into it that make it more usable for cinema. First of all, uh, a lot of them will, will have special lenses uh, that change the aspect ratio of the image so that it will fit on a cinema screen. And uh, that's a, a matter we're not going to get into here. Uh, but some of the more practical uh, differences between the two lenses is that a, a camera lens uh, has a, an aperture that clicks from stop to stop so that you can kind of feel where you are. You know that after a couple of clicks, you've gone from you know f2.8 to f5.6, and you don't have, have to look to know that. You can feel it. Um, that would not work in a cinema camera because you have to actually change the aperture as you're shooting in order to compensate for changes in light or a moving subject. Uh, and uh, you know, being able to control the, the depth of field and the amount of light getting to your sensor in real time is challenging. And uh, you need a, a, an aperture ring that doesn't, uh, that doesn't click. Another thing is that most camera lenses have fairly short th throws on the, the focusing ring. It'll usually uh, average about, I'm guessing, 100 degrees or so. Uh, 90 to 100 degrees. That's the full throw from farthest focus to closest focus it is a quarter of a turn of the uh, of the focus ring. That's not enough wiggle room uh, for a cinema lens. Your uh, changes in focus need to be more fluid and you need to have more range to work in. And that's why a cinema lens generally has a much longer focus throw, all the way up to almost a complete revolution of the focus ring. So you have to move the ring a lot further to change the same amount of focus. That gives you finer control over the focus. There are a couple of the things, but uh, there, are, there are others like having uh, an external uh, mechanical gear uh, assembly that allows you to control the focus with a separate device. Uh, that is a nice feature to have on a cinema lens that you wouldn't need on a camera lens. And to take all of those things, the, the, the adaptations to make a macro lens out of a camera lens, and then to add those features would make, that would make it a, a cinema ready lens uh, is a lot of work. And um, yeah, trust Leowa to do that work and make one. And that's what they've done. That's what this is. And it is amazingly successful at uh, doing what it promises it can do. Let me show you the lens and explain to you a few of the, the things about it. The first thing you'll notice when you pick it up, well, the first thing you'll notice when you pick it up is that it's in a big black box. The case that it comes in is absolutely gorgeous. It's a uh, bulletproof drop from an aeroplane proof uh, pelican type case. Doesn't look anything like a pelican to me, but that's what they call it. And it's waterproof. It's for going out in the elements with your, with your macro lens. And uh, it's a beauty. But once you get inside, the lens itself, it weighs a ton. Not actually a ton, it weighs a kilo. It weighs two pounds. 
And uh, for a relatively compact lens, that is a solid chunk of metal. It really is. It's very substantial uh, feel. It has a lovely slip off uh, kind of uh, pressure fit uh, lens cap. This is worth listening to. Don't you like that? Feels as good as it sounds. Anyway, the lens itself is, is lovely. It's got a nubbin on it. I love things with nubbins on them. This nubbin is to support the weight of the lens when you have it on the camera. It's a bit much for most cameras. I say, must say when I was using it in the studio, I didn't support the lens. I had it on the Z8. Uh, but when I was out in the field with it, I, I, I made a, a plate that went underneath it um, and uh, mounted everything on that plate. Uh, and that's pretty necessary. That's why this thing is here. Uh, the uh, the lens is internally focusing, uh, which means that when you turn the focus ring, the length of the lens itself doesn't change. Uh, but uh, it, all of the goings on are happening inside the lens. You'll notice that the focus ring itself has these gorgeous heavy teeth. Uh, these are standard 0.8 uh, cinema lens uh, gears. And this means that it'll work perfectly with a follow focus device, the thing I was describing for changing focus off, uh, off the rig itself. It has a similar ring with gears for the aperture. And you'll notice that the aperture, while it doesn't have a huge range, only goes from uh, the equivalent of f22 down to f2.8. They call it T in cinema lenses because uh, it's for transmission, and it's uh, more concerned with the amount of light that gets through the aperture and onto the sensor than depth of field. But uh, the, um, uh, the, the numbers mean essentially the same. And the throw is smooth, so it doesn't have a click, which means you can change the aperture, make subtle changes to the, uh, to the amount of light getting through without having a sudden change in the, uh, in the footage. Um, there is uh, no electrical connection with this lens. There are no buttons or uh, contacts on it. It is a completely manual lens. And that's uh, important when you uh, go to buy a, a, an adapter for your camera, uh, you'll, that you'll get the right one. You don't need a fancy uh, adapter with connectors in it because there are no connectors in, on this lens. In fact, because uh, this comes in um, uh, mounts for, uh, let me see, Canon, a couple of Canon mounts, an ARRI mount, and uh, a few others. It does not come in a Nikon mount. Not exactly sure why that is. They sent me the Canon version, and um, uh, it's fantastic. The adapter I got was an inexpensive one. I was, was unable to find, um, the Leowa makes an adapter for this. I was unable to find one. Um, but I did find this and it was very inexpensive, uh, not even $30. And uh, yeah, it mounts uh, onto, the, uh, onto the lens, clicks in place, and this is what goes on the camera. This end goes straight onto the Z8. In adding a little extra length, it does make the, the lens feel a bit heavier at the end. It balances well with the camera, though. It's great on the, on the Z8. Uh, you can notice by uh, inspecting the uh, innards of the thing that the, the external elements are coated. Uh, you can see the lovely green coating in the right light. Also, um, a, a quick look at the um, aperture blades. If you look in from the front, you can, uh, you can really see them very nicely. There are 13 of them and uh, they had nice rounded edges. So they make for a very uh, smooth um, out of focus uh, bokeh type pattern. And uh, I actually uh, used the, um, uh, the, the entrance and exit pupils to calculate the magnification. And indeed, uh, it is exactly as uh, described. If you're wondering why I'm not showing you this lens mounted on the camera, it's because I'm actually shooting something with the camera right now and can't. I'm a busy guy. I, I have to, to keep keep moving along. Other features that uh, I didn't show you include uh, very nice markings of the uh, distance and uh, scale uh, on, on the uh, uh, focus ring and on the uh, aperture uh, control on both sides of the lens. Uh, 
which means whichever way you're using this, you've got a very quick and easy look, both in meters and in imperial measurements, to know exactly where you are uh, distance-wise from your focal plane. It's very helpful when you're focusing, especially when you're getting used to it. A look at the specs will tell you that this is a 100 millimeter lens, as you would expect from the name, dead giveaway. Uh, it has an angle of view of only 24 degrees. That is, uh, that is very small, and uh, it allows you to get a really shallow depth of field and uh, isolate macro subjects really well. Uh, they make a, um, a shorter focal length uh, lens that has a wider angle of view, but this is perfect for the kind of thing that, that uh, I would be doing with it. Uh, it is full frame compatible, so whatever camera you happen to be using, it's uh, most cinema cameras use a much smaller sensor than full frame. Uh, so the the full 35 millimeter frame is uh, it's hard to get a, a a lens for a camera like that uh, if you're planning on shooting uh, high quality cinema stuff. Uh, there are 12 elements in 10 groups. The uh, minimum focusing distance is 24.7 centimeters. That is 24 centimeters from the sensor to the subject, which uh, corresponds to about eight centimeters in front of the lens, uh, which is, I just brought a visual aid to, to show you where my thumb is to the lens is about your minimum working distance. Okay, that's not bad. It's like there, it's close. And don't forget that's at a two to one magnification. Uh, the uh, focus throw, I said, was, was large. It's 220 degrees on the focus ring. That's, it feels like a full turn. It's, uh, that is a huge uh, focus throw. All of that in the same direction. Oh, geez. It's, it's, you have to move your hand a couple of times to make it around 220 degrees. It has a standard 77 millimeter filter thread on the front, which is handy because you don't want to be out in nature shooting with one of these things without some kind of a, a neutral density filter. I have a variable neutral density filter that I use uh, for this kind of uh, situation, and it's very useful in extending the, uh, uh, the, the capacity of the lens to keep up with you know, rapid changes in light, going from bright light to darker light, allows you to keep your settings uh, closer using the variable uh, ND filter. Uh, let me see what else. It weighs uh, almost a kilo, two pounds, 2.2 pounds, something like that. Feels like it weighs every bit of that. It's a good, solid, heavy lens. It does come in Canon EF as well as a Canon R. It has a Leica mount, a Sony mount, and, and an ARRI mount. Um, no danger of me ever needing an ARRI mount, um, but uh, yeah, you never know with the others. Um, I don't know if they're going to make a, a Nikon mount for it, but it is absolutely no big deal to, to put the adapter on. It works perfectly. So let me tell you about my experience with the lens, what I think about it, uh, the, the pros and cons of having this lens for shooting video, and um, tell you what you can expect uh, if you decide to buy one of these, and then tell you how much money you're going to have to spend if you want to buy one of these. You'll want to know that too. To understand the complexity of using one of these lenses, it helps to think a little bit about the difference between a still photograph and a video uh, clip. The still photograph requires that the camera be in focus at one point in time when you open the shutter. The rest of the time it can be wherever you want to have it. It doesn't matter, it's not being recorded. So you, you get um, to, to decide on a, a focal plane and uh, even shoot around that frame if you want to bracket around it or um, uh, shoot a bunch of test shots to find out where you want your focal plane. In video, your subject has to be in focus unless you want them out of focus for creative reasons. It needs to be in focus the whole time. And when a subject is moving, uh, that greatly uh, increases the complexity of uh, using the lens. If your uh, subject is moving from light to dark, uh, then you can decide whether or not you want to photograph it in the light part or the dark part and set your settings accordingly and take the picture. 
Um, you can uh, even change the settings uh, between the, the transition and then shoot a picture before and after. But when you're shooting video and your subject moves from light to dark, you need to move with them uh, across that transition while keeping the image as uh, unjarring as possible uh, to smooth that transition from dark to light or light to dark. A still photograph can be taken in a, a fraction of a second and it can very often be done holding the camera. Uh, it's uh, not difficult to get very, very nice sharp photographs handheld. That is not true for video. Uh, in video, uh, handheld uh, motion picture capture is for the birds, if you ask me. I did go out a couple of times and try it. It was uh, pretty much a waste of um, a waste of electrons. Um, the, uh, the the camera and uh, lens together are very heavy, and keeping that stable during a, a pan or during a, a zoom um, on a subject. It's just about impossible. Uh, it, it, there are reasons that all this equipment has grown up around cine lenses and cine cameras. Uh, it's because you need it. You need to have a stable platform to shoot from. And of course, the other big difference between stills and video is I know how to shoot stills. I'm not going to show a whole lot of my footage, um, mainly because it's not particularly good. It's not particularly bad, but I don't think it illustrates any points uh, particularly well. Uh, it will be more, I think, uh, informative to tell you what I thought of using the lens, how it, how it worked in nature, what kind of problems I had with it. And uh, it, from that uh, perspective, uh, I loved it, absolutely loved it. The weight is perfect. Uh, it, uh, it, it's a perfect match for the Z8. Uh, like I mentioned, I put it on a fairly stout aluminum rail, a base rail that I made myself. I didn't have uh, the, the kind of rail I needed with the holes at the right spacing, so I just made one. Uh, and it worked really well. And I just mounted it on a tripod and kept the, the lens and camera on the tripod when I was out shooting. Now, that be becomes a lot of work to, to move from subject to subject, to change the position of the tripod. And uh, occasionally I would just put the legs of the tripod together and use it as a monopod uh, when uh, I was shooting stuff that was a bit higher up off the ground. I don't have a, a very good tripod right now. And um, uh, the, the one I was using was not good for getting super low to the ground. So I used the beanbag for, for uh, a fair amount of my, my shooting. The job of composing a, a shot in video uh, of, of really composing a scene in video, what you're going to show and the order things are going to happen and uh, where your camera needs to be and how it needs to be focused and how the aperture needs to adjust uh, during the, the moves is very complicated and challenging. And if you've not done much of it, it can be very frustrating. And uh, my uh, earliest uh, experiences with, uh, with the lens were, were frustrating. Uh, I felt like uh, I ought to be getting uh, better, better footage than I was, but it gets better with time. It, it just takes, uh, it, it takes work. Once I got familiar with uh, the focus control and the aperture for that matter, and could uh, control them just with a fingertip, I got more comfortable and more able to think more about the shots themselves. But don't expect uh, an investment in a lens like this to make you a better uh, macro cine videographer than you were 10 minutes ago. It's, it's not going to happen, though it certainly is going to uh, pave the way to much, much better footage um, than you could possibly get with a macro lens. With a macro lens, you're pretty much stuck um, with the, the, the aperture you start out at and uh, your, your uh, control of focus is nowhere near as good as with this. Um, there uh, are a couple of uh, accessories that I would highly recommend uh, you invest in. If you're going to buy a lens like this, I would think about the stuff you're going to need uh, to go with it. I would not buy this lens unless I was going to buy a cage for my camera. 
something uh, that I could mount rails on or rods on to support the lens. Also, uh, I absolutely loved my RM75 uh, LED light. You know I use this for everything. But uh, it would have been hard to use without this. Also from small rig, um, this uh, clamp that goes on the hot shoe. It's, it's one of the nubbin clamps. Um, uh, but uh, it's perfect for lighting in this kind of video. And this was on the camera all the time. So I could just flip it on whenever I needed it and, uh, and get plenty, plenty of light on my subject. Yeah, this thing holds a charge forever too. So uh, get that, get yourself an inexpensive monitor. You can get a five and a half inch monitor uh, from Field World for 200 and something dollars. But having that is crucial. You need a fluid head on your, um, uh, on your tripod. Uh, a regular ball head may work, um, depends. If it's a really good one, it, it, it may work. Uh, if it has enough uh, motion, the magic ball probably from um, uh, from Novaflex would be would be one good choice. But do not, on any condition, try using a geared head like I did. That's that is no good at all. It will not work for video. It's difficult to maneuver. It's jerky, and it just uh, it, it's not responsive to to your inputs. Uh, and I've got a nice one. It just doesn't work for this. It works great for everything else, but not for that. Batteries don't last very long when you're shooting video and cards fill up very quickly. So be aware, take extras. One other thing that I wish I'd had that I didn't have, and it would have made a big difference, was um, some kind of a handle to go on the, the uh, camera rig itself because uh, it does get heavy uh, carrying that in a tripod around uh, in the woods for any amount of time. So that would have been good. Let's talk very briefly about the price. It's $1,000. And $1,000, when you're talking about a camera lens, is probably these days not that much. I mean, not for a premium lens. The, the Nikon macro lens is uh, a $1,000 lens. And uh, you can spend way more than that uh, on uh, uh, on cinema lenses. You can spend in the multiple thousands of dollars. Now, uh, you can actually spend multiple thousands of dollars on Leowa cinema lenses. Uh, so the the price of only a thousand dollars for a lens that admittedly has a fairly specific use plan for it, wildlife videography as well as product uh, videography for shooting uh, product uh, close-ups. Wonderful for that. Uh, so bear that in mind that um, uh, the, the price is, if you're going to compare it apples to apples to other cinema lenses, it's a bargain. Um, if you're going to compare it to, to, to camera lenses, it's at the high end of a 100 millimeter macro lens range, but it's still not out of range. I would say that this lens is very comparable optically to the 100 millimeter lens that I used a couple of summers ago. A very fine macro lens indeed, completely manual um, and uh, a lot of fun to use. This is very similar, uh, though it has the, the video features we talked about. So pros and cons. The lens is fun to use. It's very easy to use in terms of uh, its controls. They do exactly what you expect them to do and it works beautifully. I never tried it with a follow focus device. Uh, I would have liked to have done that and maybe uh, I'll have it long enough to give that a try. Um, I, I, I think that it would uh, uh, add something to it, uh, but certainly as it is, it's a lot of fun to use. For some people, this might be a con. For me, it was a pro. It's heavy, but it is the perfect weight for the camera I had it on. I wouldn't have wanted a lighter lens. It weighs about the same as my 2470 that I'm shooting this video with. Uh, that's a heavy lens too, and um, uh, it works perfectly. Um, the, the balance is great. I would list the price as a pro, definitely. I would have uh, expected this to be a lot more expensive uh, than it is. By the way, apropos of nothing, the Oregon, the high magnification uh, lens system that I reviewed uh, from Leowa, 
just a, a couple of months ago, that has uh, won an award, a, a major award. So congratulations, Mr. Lee. Congratulations, Leo. It's well, well deserved. That's a wonderful lens too. This is in every respect as much fun as that, and it fills an important niche. So it is uh, uh, fun to use, easy to use, built like a tank and uh, housed in something that's even more resilient than the tank. So it's, uh, it, it'll last a lifetime. Uh, it's uh, very modern. It has uh, all the, the, the macro elements you need in a, in a, in a proper macro lens, aspheric and uh, extra low dispersion lenses. It has all the modern coatings. Uh, it's um, uh, internally focusing. It's weather sealed. It's, uh, it, it's perfect for any conditions you're likely to find yourself in with it. So there aren't really many negatives. If there is one negative, uh, it would be that I am still not used to shooting at two to one. Um, I feel like I would uh, have a little bit more comfort in shooting at one to one in the, the video like this. Um, two to one, it's a little harder for me to in, uh, intuitively know how to frame shots. And there was a little bit more hunting around for, uh, for, for the right composition. I, I will admit that that's probably uh, me, not, not anything to do with the lens and uh, where my comfort level is. A lot of you have grown up with Leowa lenses and you're used to the, the whole idea of two to one. And that's fantastic. Um, and you'll love this lens uh, because it does give you that magnification. And when you need the magnification, of course, it's fantastic. So all in all, uh, this gets, uh, I don't know, four or five thumbs up, um, all the thumbs up. It, it's fantastic. There's, there's, if you are in the market as a macro photographer uh, for a lens that will allow you to max out your capabilities in video, this is the lens to have. This will undoubtedly improve the quality of your footage. Uh, it is bright and sharp. The images that it, it, that it does take when the videographer can get the thing in focus are breathtaking. And uh, for, uh, for anybody who does any kind of um, uh, uh, product videography at all, this is a must must have. I mean, it really ups your game for, for close up product stuff. Um, and then for anybody who's just always uh, looking for something new and exciting to try in macro, this is a new and exciting kind of macro uh, experience. And uh, I am thoroughly enjoying it. Hopefully I'll have some some halfway decent footage to show you. I'm going to show you a few clips here at the end. And, uh, and just uh, more to prove to you that uh, I can't do it than, uh, than anything else. But it doesn't change my, uh, my assessment of the lens. It is an absolute cracker of a lens. There is nothing that, that uh, uh, concerns me about it other than what I've mentioned. And uh, if you're in the market, go get one because they're, they're probably going to sell out of these things when word gets out. Thanks for watching. Have a good day. I'll see you in the uh, next thing very soon, which is probably going to be a competition results video. I'll see you then. Take care. Good night.